Hello everyone, this lecture is looking at interpretation of interesting ECGs. Please make sure you view the mechanisms of arrhythmia lecture prior to viewing this one, as many of the concepts are already highlighted in that lecture. First we'll talk about some bradycardia ECGs. As we had discussed, bradycardias are related to either sinus node or the AV node. Those relating to the sinus node are either sinus bradycardia, sinoatrial ex exit block, sinus pause, or sinus arrest. Those relating to the AV node are either first degree AV block. This is actually a misnomer and does not cause bradycardia and is not true block. It's simply prolongation of the PR interval. Second degree type 1 and type 2 AV block. As we discussed, second degree uh, AV block means that some P waves conduct and some don't. If there is PR prolongation prior to loss of conduction, this is type 1 or winky back. If there is no PR prolongation prior to loss of conduction, this is type 2 or Mobitz 2. Third degree AV block is complete heart block where the P waves and QRS complexes are completely dissociated. Please interpret this ECG, pause the video, and we will answer and explain after. For this particular ECG, the patient is bradycardic with a heart rate of less than 50 beats per minute. There is no sinus P wave. As you can see, the axis of this P wave is abnormal. It is isoelectric in lead 1 and negative in lead 2, so it's not a sinus P wave. So here we have a diagnosis of sinus node dysfunction with an atrial rhythm coming from a place other than the sinus node. So cells in the atrium other than the sinus node have taken over the pacing function of the sinus node. This is called ectopic atrial escape rhythm. Ectopic meaning from somewhere other than the sinus node. And it's an atrial escape rhythm. Please interpret this ECG. So this ECG also shows evidence of bradycardia with no sinus P waves and so there is an element of sinus node dysfunction but there is no atrial P, uh, rhythm to begin with. There is no P wave and here we have only QRS complexes which are not preceded by a P wave. However, those QRS complexes are quite narrow so they're not, they cannot be originating from the ventricles because then they would be wide. This is an example of a junctional escape rhythm, meaning that the escape rhythm is coming from below the atrium but above the ventricles. It's either coming from the AV node or the his Purkinje system. So this is a junctional escape rhythm. Please interpret this ECG. Here you can see that some P waves conduct and some don't. So here we have a, a P wave with a normal PR interval and a QRS complex. Here we have a P wave with a prolonged PR interval and a QRS complex. Here we have a P wave with an even longer QR, a PR interval and a QRS complex. It is likely that this P wave does not conduct, rather that this is a junctional escape rhythm. There should be another P wave that lands within the QRS complex, but we don't see it, because if you map these P waves out, there should be another one that lands here. Then there is no QRS complexes until this one, which is likely also an escape. Then you go back to the same pattern. So this is second degree type 1 or Mobitz 1 or winky back where you have prolongation of the PR interval then a blocked P wave and in this case you have junctional escape beats that prevent long pauses. Please interpret this ECG. So this is an example of a P wave that's followed by QRS, P wave QRS P wave QRS, there is no prolongation of the PR interval, and then suddenly there is a loss of a QRS complex. So there is, mo there is most of the P waves conduct, 
some don't with no prolongation of the PR interval. This is second degree block type 2 or Mobitz 2. Please interpret this ECG. So here, as you can see, these, this P wave conducts, this one doesn't, this P wave conducts, this one doesn't, so half of the P wave conducts. So this is 2 to 1 AV block. Now we can't tell if this is type 1 or type 2 because we don't see if there's prolongation of the PR intervals because there are no two P waves in a row that conduct. If this P wave conducted and this P wave conducted, we could see if there's prolongation of the PR, but because it's 2 to 1, we don't see that. In this particular case, this is second degree AV block, but we can't tell if it's type 1 or type 2. There are some subtle hints, however. If the QRS is narrow, it's more likely proximal conduction with problem within the AV node and more likely to be type 1. If the QRS is wide, then it's more likely to be distal conduction system disease and more likely type 2. However, these rules are not absolute, and the best thing to do in this case is to get the patient to exercise in bed or walk around with observation and see if you can improve conduction across the AV node and bring out either a type 1 or type 2 pattern. We're going to move on to tachycardias, first looking at narrow complex tachycardias. We've discussed that irregular, irregular tachycardias are more like, most likely atrial fibrillation. There are some other rare causes, however, most of the time, irregular, irregular rhythm is atrial fibrillation. In a regular rhythm, it's either sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, or atrial flutter. This here is an example of a narrow complex tachycardia. It's hard to tell exactly what kind of tachycardia it is. It's hard to see any P waves, but we do see that it is tachycardic and the, with the QRS complex being narrow. So the differential is what we see on the slide. It's either sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, or atrial flutter. One way we can bring out what exactly this is is to give adenosine. When adenosine is administered, in this case, here we do a 12 lead ECG with an adenosine injection, and what happens is the tachycardia will terminate. There's two P waves that don't conduct because of the adenosine, which serves, which serves as an AV nodal blocking agent, and then we return back to sinus rhythm. So adenosine serves as an AV blocking agent temporarily, but it terminates the tachycardia. So this must be a tachycardia that is reliant on AV nodal conduction. Hence, this must be either AVNRT or AVRT. Whereas the other tachycardias, such as sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter, or atrial tachycardia, will slow down with adenosine, but not terminate. Here's another example. As we can see, this is a narrow complex tachycardia of some sorts. We do see that there are P waves here. They don't look like sinus P waves. They're not positive in one and two. So this could be one of the others, either AVRT, atrial tachycardia, atypical AVNRT, or atrial flutter. To bring out what this could be, we can give adenosine to block the AV node and see the response. If it terminates, it's likely AVNRT or AVRT if it continues, it's either atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter. So here adenosine is given with transient block of the AV node. You see the tachycardia is going, then there is a V nodal block, and the slide is not long enough, but if I was to keep going, I could show you that the tachycardia resumes just like before. However, during this pause, you see sawtooth pattern in the inferior leads. So the answer is atrial flutter. This is atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction, and it's simply difficult to see the flutter waves when the heart rate is so fast, but when you block the AV node, it's easier to see the flutter waves.
We will now move on to some examples of a white complex tachycardias. Please pause and interpret this ECG. This is an example of a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. As you can see, all these Kers complexes are preceded by pacing spikes, so this is some sort of pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Now this is beyond the scope of medical school, however there is a differential to pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Pacemaker mediated tachycardia could be stopped by applying a magnet over the pacemaker. The magnet will force the pacemaker to pace at a fixed heart rate of approximately 60 to 70 beats per minute depending on the manufacturer. These magnets are available in all crash carts and look like a blue donut. The differential diagnosis for pacemaker mediated tachycardia inclu includes rate response, which is a function of the pacemaker to increase the rate, atrial arrhythmias that are being tracked by the pacemaker. So the pacemaker is actually tracking an atrial arrhythmia and pacing the ventricle to try to keep up. There are functions within the pacemaker to prevent this from happening, but they are not always turned on or they are not always functioning due to the speed of the arrhythmia. There is another form called pacemaker mediated tachycardia. I will not address this right now, however, however there's a lot of literature on this if you're interested. It, it, um, it's caused by ventricular pacing and retrograde conduction across the AV node leading to atrial sensing, then ventricular pacing again. It's also called endless loop tachycardia. This could be stopped by applying a magnet over the pacemaker and then simple reprogramming the pacemaker can preventing, prevent it from happening again. In this particular case, a magnet is applied and we see that the patient is in atrial flutter underneath. So the pacemaker is sensing the atrial flutter and pacing rapidly in response and in order to stop this from happening, we can turn a function on in the pacemaker called mode switch, which will allow the pacemaker to switch to a single, pace, single chamber pacing mode and ignore those flutter waves. Please interpret this ECG. This is an example of a white complex tachycardia. As you can see, the heart rate is tachycardic and the QRS is very wide. We previously discussed the differential of a white complex tachycardia. This could be ventricular fibrillation, pacemaker mediated tachycardia, pre excited tachycardia, or ventricular tachycardia. Now, in this case, there are no pacemaker spikes, so there's not pacemaker mediated tachycardia. The rhythm is organized and monomorphic, so it's not ventricular fibrillation, which looks very chaotic and unorganized. So it's either pre excited tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, or SVT with aberrancy. What do we mean by SVT with aberrancy? This is an example of sinus rhythm with a left bundle branch block. As you can see, there is a wide negative QRS in lead V1 and an RS R prime in lead V6. This is a typical example of a left bundle branch block. You can imagine that if this patient develops supraventricular tachycardia such as atrial flutter, it will look like a white complex tachycardia, but it's exact but it's actually a supraventricular tachycardia coming from the atrium. So in left bundle branch block, there is conduction along the right bundle and then moving, slow moving of depolarization through the muscle towards the left ventricle. And because V1 is located on the right side, we will see a large deflection away from V1 and towards V6. Hence, in left bundle branch block, in V1, the QRS complex will be negative, and in V6, which sits over here, the QRS complex will be positive. This is an example of sinus rhythm with a right bundle branch block. You see an RS, R prime in V1, and a wide QRS. In right bundle branch block, initial depolarization through the left bundle, and then slowly goes towards the right side. So you see a positive deflection in lead V1 and a negative terminal deflection in lead V6.
This is an example of right bundle branch block with a left axis deviation because 2 is negative and 1 is positive. This is an example of right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block. It looks just like right bundle branch block, but because the left anterior fascicle of the left bundle is blocked, you get left axis deviation because depolarization through the muscle takes place towards the lateral aspect of the heart, pushing the QRS towards the left axis. Likewise, this is an example of right bundle branch block with right axis deviation, where 1 is negative and 2 is positive. This is right bundle branch block and left posterior fascicular block, where you have depolarization across the left anterior fascicle and then slow depolarization towards the posterior portion of the left ventricle and the right ventricle, causing, left, causing a right axis deviation. The reason we discussed all of those is to show that a baseline wide QRS can lead to SVT with aberrancy. And it's important, to, it's important to distinguish SVT from aberrancy from VT because ventricular tachycardia has a poor outcome and can lead to sudden death. This is an example where ventricular tachycardia degenerates into ventricular fibrillation and leads to a cardiac arrest. Whereas supraventricular tachycardia is a more benign diagnosis and will not lead to sudden death. Now, if you see an example of a broad complex tachycardia clinically and the patient's unstable, it's better to treat it as ventricular tachycardia and not worry whether you're missing SVT with aberrancy. If the patient is stable, try to obtain a 12-lead ECG and work through what, whether it's SVT with aberrancy or VT after. However, if the patient's unstable, assume that it's ventricular tachycardia and treat accordingly according to the ACLS guidelines. Now there are ways on an ECG to tell if the white complex tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. For example, atrial flutter with a left bundle branch block or atrial flutter with a right bundle branch block. If you see AV dissociation, meaning that there's more ventricular complexes than atrial complexes, this is, this will give you a diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia. If you see what we call capture or fusion beats, meaning that some that you see a narrow complex within the white complex tachycardia, this also proves ventricular tachycardia. If there's extreme axis deviation, meaning that leads 1 and 2 are both negative, this makes it likely that this is ventricular tachycardia. If the QRS complex is extremely wide, more than 140 milliseconds if it looks like a right bundle, or more than 160 milliseconds if it looks like a left bundle, that also suggests ventricular tachycardia. And finally, if there's percolial concordance, meaning that all the percolial leads, V1 to V6, are negative or positive, that pushes away from supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. These rules are published in the paper in circulation at all, and they are referred to as the Brogada algorithm. There are many more algorithms out there. This is the most commonly used. If you are interested, please refer to the publication for further reading. This is an example of a white complex tachycardia. And in order to figure out if this is ventricular tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, we will look for some of these things that we discussed before. Please pause the video and, and try to decide what this is. If you look closely, you see that there are P waves within the tachycardia, but there are more QRS complexes than P waves. If there are more QRS complexes than P waves, this must be ventricular tachycardia. This is an example where we have a white complex tachycardia, but there is a narrower complex right in the middle. This is an example of a fusion beat which proves that this must be ventricular tachycardia. What is a fusion beat? A fusion beat or a capture beat is when one of the P waves that we don't see here, one of the sinus beats, actually makes it through the respiratory system 
and either captures myocardium fully, and you get a narrow QRS in the middle of the ventricular tachycardia, or fuses with the wavefront of the ventricular tachycardia to give a slightly narrower QRS. So here, one of the P waves that are hidden has conducted along the Hesperkitchen system and fused with the tachycardia, given what looks like a narrower beat, a fusion beat. And this proves that there must be P waves dissociated from the ventricular rhythm, so this must be monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Here's another example of a white complex tachycardia. In this particular case, we see extreme axis deviation. The QRS is negative in lead 1 and 2. The axis is so off that this cannot be coming from the atria or through the Hesperkinji system. This must be ventricular tachycardia. If it's difficult to tell, if you don't see AV dissociation and you don't see extreme axis deviation or capture or fusion beats, you could try to figure out does the QRS complex look like a typical left bundle branch block or a typical right bundle branch block. If it does, then it is likely to be SVT with aberrancy. So back to our initial example. What exactly is this? It's a white complex tachycardia. We don't see evidence of P wave dissociation. There is no P waves that we can see. However, there is extreme axis deviation. So this is likely to be ventricular tachycardia. Monomorphic VT. It also does not look like a typical right bundle or left bundle. Hence, pushing diagnosis towards VT, making it more likely. Here's another example of a white complex tachycardia. If you look at the rules we've discussed before, this looks like ventricular tachycardia. It does not look like a typical left bundle or a right bundle. However, after we get this patient out of their rhythm, we see that they have pre-excitation. They have a delta wave. So that was an example of antidromic AVRT, where the patient has an accessory pathway and depolarization is going down the pathway and up the AV node. And because we're going down the pathway through muscle rather than the Hitzberg-Kinji system, we get a wide complex QRS and a wide complex tachycardia. Please interpret this ECG. In this particular ECG, we have a wide complex tachycardia. It's very wide. All the complexes look similar. They don't look exactly the same, but they look similar. It's also irregularly irregular. Now, when we say irregularly irregular, what does that trigger in your mind? We have previously discussed that atrial fibrillation can look irregularly irregular. However, atrial fibrillation, when it does conduct to the ventricles, usually conducts at a slower rate because the AV node has decremental conduction properties. So this is atrial fibrillation conducting to the ventricles with a very fast and fast rate and a wired QRS complexes. This is an example of a pre-excited atrial fibrillation. What is pre-excited atrial fibrillation? This is atrial fibrillation in the atrium that is conducting down an accessory pathway. This could lead to syncope, palpitations, or sudden death if it's going uh, very fast. So we've talked about multiple ways in which accessory pathways can present. If somebody has an accessory pathway, it will show up as pre-excitation on their ECG with a delta wave. They can have orthodromic tachycardia, so Superventricular tachycardia going down the AV node and up the accessory pathway, down the AV node, up the accessory pathway, giving a narrow complex tachycardia. They can have antidromic tachycardia or antidromic AVRT going down the accessory pathway and up the AV node, down the accessory pathway, up the AV node, giving a white complex regular tachycardia. Or they can have pre-excited 
tachycardia, such as atrial fibrillation, where they have either atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter conducting rapidly down the, AV, down the accessory pathway and giving a white complex tachycardia as well. Here's another example of pre-excited atrial fibrillation. It is a white complex tachycardia that's irregularly irregular with all the QRS complexes looking similar to each other. Pre-excited tachycardia or pre-excited, sorry, pre-excited atrial fibrillation is not benign and can degenerate into atrial interventricular fibrillation and cause sudden death. The rate is so high that it can cause ischemia within the heart and lead to sudden death. Hence, it is a medical emergency. Please interpret this ECG. Now, this is another example of a white crest tachycardia. You can see that it's a regular white complex tachycardia. The differential is ventricular tachycardia, pre-excited tachycardia, or SVT with a baronacy. If we look over here, the axis is not very much off. It may, there may be some left axis deviation, but it's not extreme axis deviation. We don't see any P waves that are dissociated from the QRS. There is no capture of fusion beats. So finally, we look at the QRS complex. Does it look like a typical right bundle or left bundle? Now here you see a small RSR prime. This does truly look like a right bundle. This is in fact SVT with a barency. It's SVT with underlying right bundle branch block. So it looks like white complex tachycardia, but it's actually SVT with a barency. Here's another example of a white complex tachycardia. There is left axis deviation, but it's not extreme axis deviation. We don't see any P waves that are dissociated from the QRS. And the QRS looks like a typical left bundle branch block. Hence, this is likely SVT with a barency due to left bundle branch block. One way to tell would be to give adenosine. And when we give adenosine in this case, we uncover P waves. This is actually an example of sinus tachycardia where we have positive P waves in lead 1 and 2, and as soon as the densine wears out, the tachycardia continues. Here's the last ECG of the slide set. Please pause the presentation and interpret this ECG. So here we see no no clear distinct P waves, right? There is no P waves. There is some sort of wavy baseline. This is what atrial fibrillation looks like. So there is no clear P waves, a wavy baseline. This is atrial fibrillation. We did discuss, however, that atrial fibrillation should conduct to the ventricle with an irregularly irregular rate. But here we see ventricular complexes that are regular and wide. Why is that? There must be a disconnection between the atrial fibrillation and the ventricles. This is actually an example of atrial fibrillation with complete heart block. So there is atrial fibrillation, but there's complete AV block. Hence, the fibrillation is not conducting to the ventricle. And what we see is a ventricular escape rhythm. It's a wide escape rhythm because the ventricular cells have taken over as the pacing cells to prevent the person from dying, and they're escaping at a very slow, regular rate. So this is atrial fibrillation with complete heart block and a ventricular escape rhythm. Obviously, this patient will need a pacemaker. Hopefully that was useful. Thank you very much. Please feel free to forward any questions or concerns.